So last month while we were in Bermuda, uh, we had gone on to the, um, we took a day to go to the, the Royal Naval Dockyards where the group wanted to do some shopping, get some food. Uh, we ended up uh, speaking to some random folks while we were there. And it was coming up on time, we needed to head back to uh, our house, to Hamilton. And so I decided, I told the group, I'm going to go on ahead, I'll get the tickets. Um, and the group wanted to get these, uh, these fish sandwiches on raisin bread. They were delicious. They were incredible. Like, probably if you ever go to Bermuda, you have to go to the Royal Naval Dockyards, get the, 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 the halibut fish on the raisin bread. It was amazing, okay? So I decided I'm going on ahead because as good as it is, we can't miss our ferry because if we do, we're, it's going to push us an hour behind and then we miss our next appointment later on. So as I went on, I got the tickets, I'm waiting now, or the coins actually, I'm waiting now on, on the boat, on the ferry. And as people start walking in, I see our group kind of strolling on up and um, people were walking up and I've been confused for many things, but this was the first time I was ever confused um, for this specific uh, role. So as I'm standing there, several people walked up and they began to uh, hand me their coin and then they would go on. And, then, and I would try to tell them, I'm like, I don't, I don't work for the ferry company. I don't work here. So it's all right, I, I turn around, I put it in. The next person comes on, they said, here you go, sir, and hands me the coin. And I'm dressed like this. I'm like, this is a fancy um, a job, like a fancy suit for this specific job. So the next person comes, the next, after the fourth or fifth time, I think I just, I must have lost my mind. And I said, if anyone else does this again, the next person walks up, hands me their coin, and I, I lost it. I responded, I said, welcome aboard the ferry from Royal Naval Dockyards to Hamilton Bay. Enjoy your ride, please keep your arms inside. And please enjoy the ride today because our co-captain Terry will be taking us on a great adventure. Welcome back and hope to see you again soon. I lost it. I lost it. Sometimes when you are confused so many times, you just kind of slip into character. And I think quite honestly, if this priesthood thing doesn't work out, I might have a calling as a cruise director. Maybe. We'll see. Today I want to discuss our identity in Christ and I want to talk specifically about this through the lens of St. Mary and who exactly is she? What is her identity? Now usually when we think of identity, we think of what a person has done. But what I want to speak about is who is she? What is her identity as a person? One of the most popular titles that's given to St. Mary is the Theotokos or Mother of God. And really what that implies or that points to when we talk about her as Mother of God is the God-bearer Christ in her. Okay? Christ in her. Christ coming forth from her. But what I'd like to do for today, for, for this morning, is start with the other side. Okay? Usually when we think of identity, we think of for St. Mary, we think of Christ in her, but what I want us to begin by is the opposite, which is her, St. Mary, in Christ, okay? Or importantly for us, us in Christ, okay? And the reason I do so is because in the New Testament, the idea of being in Christ is a very prevalent idea. Throughout the New Testament, this idea is used 175 times. You hear the phrase, in Christ, repeated all throughout the New Testament. In St. John's letters, many of them, the vast majority of them in St. Paul's letters, and then also in some of the Catholic letters, in particular Peter and John's letters. You have this idea of being in Christ, and our identity coming from being in Christ entrenched throughout the New Testament. One of the most uh, prevalent and, and, and well-known passages is in John chapter 17, where Jesus himself prays a prayer, his high priestly prayer, when he's surrounded by the disciples, and he's now speaking to the Father, and he says, my prayer is that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me, and I in you. I in them, 
and you and me. This idea of this inner penetration of us in Christ and Christ in him, just as the Son is in the Father and the Father is in the Son, this, this idea of being in Christ is something that Jesus himself establishes. A few chapters prior, you have the image of the vine. The importance of us being in Christ, right? The vine has to be in the branches. It has to be connected to the branches. Not loosely, not taped, but literally in the branch so that it can bear fruit. In Ephesians, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, you, it begins, he says, to God's holy people, this is verse 1, in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Fourteen times... In the first chapter, St. Paul repeats that phrase, in Christ. Throughout the first three chapters of Ephesians, he repeats it probably at least 30 to 40 times, in Christ. This is a major theme throughout the New Testament. In 1 John chapter 2, St. John, the beloved, he says, by this we know that we are in him, we are in him, we know our, we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought also to walk just as he walked. He's saying our identity, our identity is that we are in him. Okay? And if our identity is that we are in him, then what happens? That we walk a certain way. Anytime in the New Testament you see this language or hear this language of walking, it implies lifestyle. The way a person walks, the way a person lives their lives, right? If you're going to talk to th talk, you've got to walk the walk, right? It's this idea of how we live. But it's not the other way around. We oftentimes start with the walking, not the being in. Okay? And that's the main idea of what I want to drill in today. Is that our doing should always come out of our being. Not the other way around. Okay, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. So this first idea of being in Christ speaks to our identity. Who we are. What we are. Okay? Not what we do, but who we are. Our identity is not what we do. Our identity is Christ himself. When the Father looks at us, that he might see Christ. When others look at us, they might see Christ. Isn't it beautiful that in the New Testament, the same word is used for the Eucharist, for Jesus' body, his physical body, and for the church. Which means what? When people look at the church, they look at the Eucharist, they look at Jesus himself, they should see the same thing. When they look at us, they should see holy people. They should see something holy. When you look at the Eucharist, you say, that's all. That's not just an ordinary piece of bread. That is a holy piece of bread. Okay? When we look at the church, we should see the body of Jesus. Our identity is not, therefore, what we do. It's who we are in Christ. So, St. Mary, we oftentimes think about the fruits, but I want to begin with St. Mary in Christ. Us in Christ. And the reason I keep using that interchangeably, St. Mary and us, is because in, in, in liturgical and historical theology, whenever, and we're going to see this at the end, I have a number of different church father quotes uh, to really like, solidify this for you. Whenever we see the language about St. Mary, ultimately the church, the fathers, have told us that this is supposed to be our reality. This is supposed to be our reality. What is for St. Mary, she's not the great example, or sorry, she's not the great exception. Rather, she's the great example. Okay? So when we say that St. Mary's in Christ, that St. Mary's seated at the right hand of the Father, that St. Mary bore Christ, she's the great example that we are in Christ, that we are seated at the right hand of the Father, that we are to bear Christ in our lives. Okay? And I'll explain more on that in just a bit. But the flip is also true. It's not just St. Mary 
in Christ, but importantly, Christ in St. Mary. God himself with us. God in us. And this is part of the Christian witness from the very, very beginning. Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. In John chapter 1, it, St. John, he's giving this beautiful witness and he says that Jesus himself, the word, made his dwelling or his tabernacle amongst us. Or, sometimes tra translated, within us. We became his tabernacle, his place of dwelling. It's Christ in us. Okay? In Luke chapter 1 verse 35, And the angel answered and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. It's not that God sends His power or His grace, but God Himself says, I'm coming and dwelling inside of you. God is not sending something impersonal to us. No, no, God is saying, I'm going to come myself and make my dwelling inside of you. I was sharing with some some folks the other day, that there are those who would suggest that God is too holy and too pure to make his dwelling amongst us. That, in fact, God doesn't come in and live inside of us, but that he just sends his grace to us. This idea originates from Platonic philosophy. Because in, in Plato's thinking... Plato actually describes God, the creator, as the unmoved mover. The unmoved mover, okay? Sorry for using this philosophical language, but that's, that's how he describes the creator. He says, he's the unmoved mover. He kind of sits back and he just draws others to himself through a proxy. Because God himself cannot engage in, and touch matter because that's below him. Okay? Which is the same thing that Arius in the 4th century did. And it's that same spirit that exists amongst folks that would say, no, no, you're us. We're just, we're, 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 we're dirt. We're nothing. How could God come and dwell inside of us? And what he's saying is, no, you're holy and you're precious and you're valuable and you're a masterpiece. And I'm coming to make you my tabernacle. I'm coming inside of you. And when you receive the Eucharist, you're receiving God himself inside of you. There's nothing more intimate than receiving God inside of us. That the Son Himself and the Eucharist and the Holy Spirit, as He comes and dwells inside of us, Saint Irenaeus, he was a second century bishop from France, he says that the Son and the Spirit are the two hands of the Father, recreating us into the image of God. And that happens not from outside of us, but from within. He transforms us from, it's not about he wants to make us, give us like a, an extreme makeover, right? Make us beautiful and like give us a nice set of hair and a nice like fix our eyebrows and like make up. No, no, no. He wants to transform us from within, okay? From inside out, not from outside in. Verse 27, 1 John chapter 2, says, But the anointing, the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. The anointing, which is the Holy Spirit himself, abides in you, and you do not need anyone, need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. You will abide in him. So he's saying he comes in you, and you are in him. The two are interrelated. And this idea of not having no one to teach you, he's not saying that we shouldn't instruct and teach and, and share and, and about him to one another. But this idea of teaching, it's a, the idea of knowing him. When he's inside of you, you know him, person. One of the main ideas that St. John impresses upon over and over and over again in his epistle is this idea of knowledge of God, of knowing God. What does it mean to know God? It's not about having some peripheral knowledge about him, that we read books, but that we have an intimacy with him. 
because he is inside of me. That when I pray, St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, that the Spirit himself groans with birth pangs within. That as we find in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is instructing the church, telling the church, go there, don't go there. Don't go to Macedonia, that's a bad place. Get up, go there. And they're responding. They're ministering to the Lord, they're, they're liturgizing, they're fasting. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. And the Holy Spirit says to them, separate to me, Saul and Barnabas. And they say, okay. They're responding. Why? Because there's an intimacy. They know God firsthand. There's a, a personal encounter with God. They're not sitting reading books. No, sure, they're reading books. But that's not what it means to know God, friends. It's not, I read, read a book and, okay, I, I, I learned about God. Theology, we can't reduce theology. And by the way, all of us are theologians. We cannot reduce theology to, I read a book about God. No, theology, uh, St. Uh, Evagoras, I believe it is, he says, theology is one who prays, the theologian is one who prays, and one who truly prays is a theologian. Because what is theology? It's to know God. It's to speak of our experience of God. And how do we experience Him? Through that life of prayer. Through that life of prayer. St. Ignatius of Antioch, he was a, a bishop in Antioch at the end of the first century. He's a disciple of St. Peter, many suggest. It says, when he's speaking about the things that have been spoken from silence, and he's talking about the power of silence, by the way, here. And he's saying how, like, the virginal birth is the word himself coming forth from silence. He says, the virginity of Mary, her childbirth, and also the death of the Lord. He's preaching the vir this virginal birth as one of the great mysteries which are loudly proclaimed from silence. And so Christ in us, in order for us to experience that, there has to be a willingness and a wrestling to silence so that we can hear the word himself planted inside of us. We are so distracted by so many things. If we are able and willing to go through the discipline and the practice of silencing ourselves, not just verbally, but silencing our hearts, our desires, our wants, silencing our, 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 our thoughts that are constantly racing, just leaving them for, I'm not saying just don't think about anything ever, but training ourselves to be still and silent within. Miracles happen. The miracle of the Word Himself will be birthed within us. Okay? We'll experience not only victory over death, but we'll experience the power of the resurrection in our lives. In, um, in the Midnight Praises, in the Midnight Praises, the, uh, there's a part called the Theotokeia of Sunday. In the first section, it says, Aaron's rod, in fact, is Mary. Is Mary. It's a type of her virginity. She conceived and bore the Son of the Most High, the Word, without human seed. This idea of, of Aaron's rod being Mary, it's this rod that shouldn't have brought forth a flower. Okay? In other words, what he's telling us here is even for Mary, because she's the great example, we look and we say, Mary should, this, like how does a virgin bring forth a son? How does a rod bloom and bring forth a flower? And you look at your life and say, how is my life going to bear forth fruits? Okay? Because Christ in you, Christ in me, is the one who will bring forth fruit in my life. Okay? Our identity, our identity informs our activity. This whole idea, this whole section here is talking about how it is that our, like our lives bring forth life when Christ is in us. Okay? What we tend to focus on is this section, but what I, I really want to impress upon, impress upon you is this idea that our, it's our identity that informs what we do. It's, what, it's who we are that speaks to what we do, not the other way around. Okay? We tend to flip it. We tend to say, what I do, what I do, will, is who I am. 
And actually the opposite is true. What I believe to be the truest thing about myself is how I'll live my life. If I believe truly that I'm a child of God, and that's the truest thing I believe about myself, not what I'm told in the world, not what I'm told by my parents, not what I'm told by my, my, my spouse, not what I'm told by my children, not what I'm told by my job. If it's the truest thing I believe about myself, because God has spoken it to me, and I've, I've, I've not he's spoken it to me in a book only, but he's spoken it to me from within, Christ in us, then my life will bring forth fruit, because that's my identity. That's my identity. If my identity is a, a plum tree, I'll bring forth plums. Plum trees don't bring forth as much as I'd love for them to, right? They don't bring forth mangoes. They don't, okay? I love mangoes. But if I want a mango, I got to go to a mango tree, okay? If the truest thing about me is I'm a child of God, my life will bring forth child of God kind of stuff, okay? So our identity informs our activity. Our union of God, in other words, our union to God, leads to rebirth in our lives, okay? Put, put differently. Let me just wrap up with a few quick thoughts for you on this. In Christ, in Christ, us being in Christ, we have personal, we experience a personal union with God. Like, think about that for a second. It's not just that God came inside of St. Mary and then came out of her. No, no, there was a personal union between St. Mary and God himself that birthed forth, and, and I'm not talking about in the way like, in, a, in the way that sometimes, like people in, some people would describe like a, a, a sensual relationship. No, no, this is a, a, a union between our soul and God himself, okay? And that f brings forth life. The Holy Mary is the workshop of the union of natures, okay? He's saying what's going on here is there's this workshop, this place where um, the, 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 the natures, the human and divine nature are knit together. He says it's the marketplace of the salutary exchange. He's saying that there's this exchange that takes place inside of the virgin. And it's the bridal chamber wherein the word is spoused or took flesh. So he... Uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople, Procolus, in the year 429, he describes the Virgin as a workshop of union, a marketplace of the exchange, and the bridal chamber. There's intimacy here. There's work happening. Okay? There is life coming out. There is something that is being produced, so to speak. The church, when we speak about St. Mary... Importantly, we also talk about how St. Mary is an icon of the church. If the Virgin is the workshop, as it says here, of the union of the, of the natures, and Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we are God's workmanship, then what we can understand is that the church is the place where we experience that. Not the church as an institution, but the church as the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, is the workshop where God crafts us into his masterpiece. St. Paul says we are his workmanship, his very work as creator, created in Christ Jesus, which God prepared beforehand for good works that we should walk in them. Okay? So he's saying that we are his masterpiece. We're his masterpiece. If you had a carpenter go into his or her um, workshop, they would go to create a, a piece of art, a piece of work. Okay? They would craft it, they would chisel, they would sand it down, they would you know, maybe start over, they'd have to break certain parts, whatever. I mean, I'm not a carpenter, clearly. Okay? But they would go in and they'd do some work in order to form a masterpiece. That's what the church is doing in our lives. Again, not the church's institution, the church as this like structure. And I don't want to discount, yes, the, the institution of the church is important. I'm talking about the work of the body of Christ when we come together and we experience the mystical presence of Jesus amongst us. 
to workmanship were taken from this small, little, creepy-looking creature, like a caterpillar. Like, I'm sorry, butterflies are beautiful. Caterpillars are creepy-looking, okay? They are not the most beautiful-looking things, okay? You can probably find a cute caterpillar, okay? But this is like a, this is like a, if, if we were grading caterpillars, like one to 10, this is like a five. I saw some ones, okay? There were, there was a couple nines, okay? But I saw a couple ones that were just nasty looking. I didn't want to put them up there because I didn't want anyone to have nightmares tonight. I mean, they were horrible. They're creepy looking, okay? And let's be real. Most of us are these like little creepy, like all of us actually, were these creepy little looking caterpillar kind of things. And then, I'm not talking about physically, all of you are beautiful, okay? You're like, give me like the look, okay? No, we're like, spiritually, like we're this creepy little thing. And then we come and we're birthed inside of the body of Christ into a beautiful butterfly, okay? The church, just as St. Mary birthed Christ, is this workshop, the church is saying, as the body of Christ is birthing you, okay? The church is also the marketplace, just as the Holy Mary is the marketplace of this exchange. In Ephesians 1, it's, it's so beautiful. If St. Paul's letter, I mean, we could spend literally six months on Ephesians chapter 1 and not scratch the surface. He says, having made known to us the mystery of his will. The mystery here is describing the incarnation himself. God becoming man, God revealing himself to us in the person of Christ, okay? So it's saying he's made known to us the mystery of his will, okay? The greatest mystery is the incarnation itself, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation, that word dispensation is the economy or economy of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. He's saying, in other words, that God through the incarnation is creating this economy, okay? This pouring out, this collecting together. And the word economy here is describing this exchange that takes place, okay? That God is taking something and giving something, okay? Think about like the, the idea of bartering, right? Back in the day, people used to barter. Now we use money, okay? You go to the store, Sorry, stores are going out of fashion, okay? You go on Amazon, okay? And you select and you go kind of scroll through and you look for the best deal and you look how long and you might say, I'm gonna spend an extra couple bucks because I can do it on Amazon Prime. It'll be here in two days instead of like in 10 days, okay? So I'm gonna find the best deal and the best shipping options and all that stuff. And then your credit card charges, you pay a certain amount, but then you get something in return. And usually you try to find a pretty fair deal. Okay? This exchange that happens right here is the most unfair deal ever to happen from God's side. God is saying, I'm going to take your human nature. I'm going to let you receive me. St. Peter says that we are called to be partakers of the divine nature. So he's saying, I'm going to take your human nature and I'm going to let you partake of my nature, of me. I'm going to come inside of you. I'm going to come and dwell and live inside of you. Fair exchange? Not at all. Who's complaining? Not me, okay? I'm not complaining at all. Not fair? I'm okay with it. And quite frankly, so is God. Because God is saying, there's enough of me to go around. And by the way, this doesn't affect me one bit because I'm infinite, okay? In the Friday night feel it's okay, we say it a little bit different. We say he took what is ours and gave us what's his. So there's this exchange, this economy that's taking place. It's God in us and us in God. Christ in us and us in Christ. Okay? And when that happens, we receive a new identity. And that new identity comes through our union with God. Just want to share with you a couple of quotes from some of the church fathers. St. Irenaeus, the second century bishop from France, he says the following. He says, Chastely Christ opened the womb so that humanity might also be similarly 
reborn. Christ opened the womb so that we might, as humans, be reborn. Okay? It wasn't just that he came in order to be born, to pay a price. And to, he did it so we could be reborn. His incarnation itself, his coming into the virgin, the very act of St. Mary becoming mother of God, he, what Irenaeus is saying here to us is he did this, God did this, so that we might become reborn. St. Gregory the Wonder Worker, who we mentioned in the, the commemoration of the saints, he says the word, the divine word, came from on high and reformed, reshaped Adam into a new creation in Christ. In the holy womb of St. Mary. What he's saying is that when the word came inside of, Jesus came inside of the virgin, that he recreates all of humanity. And then in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, whoever's in Christ is a new creation, all things pass away. We have a new identity in Christ. I want to uh, wrap up here with this, this last idea of what it looks like for us to give birth to Christ in our life. How do we become Christ bearers in our life? St. Augustine said it beautifully. He says, every Christian conceives God in his heart. Every Christian conceives God in his heart. Every one of us should give birth to God from within us, in our heart. St. Ambrose, who was, died in the year 397, he says, when the soul begins to turn to Christ, she, being the soul, is addressed as Mary. How beautiful is that? When you and I, we turn our soul to Christ, our soul is addressed as Mary. That is, she receives the name of the woman who bore Christ in her womb, for she has become a soul who, in a spiritual sense, gives birth to Christ. How precious is that? When you turn your soul to Christ, your soul is given the name of Mary because then your soul gives birth to our Lord. Saint Jerome, like the blessed Mary, he was a saint that lived uh, and died in the year 420. Okay? Like the blessed Mary who was of such purity that she deserved to be mother of God, you too can be a mother of the Lord. Okay? And what's, what's there for us is that we turn to him and that we do the first step in our growth as Christians by purifying our hearts and our desires. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay? When we turn to him, we purify ourselves, we not only see him, but we become, as Ambrose says, the mother of, um, the, mother of the Lord. St. Ambrose, once again, he says, watch, watch that you do the will of the Father, so you may be the mother of Christ. I mean, think of the great honor during this two weeks that we're singing to the Virgin this, and the mother of Christ this, and the mother of our Lord this, and St. Mary this, and all of this, by the way, and, and, and this is not like, listen, there will always be only one, the Virgin Mary. Okay? And she has a place of distinction and honor in the church. For sure. But when we say she sits to the right, that is prepared for you and I, friends. You have a great value before God. One last, one last uh, quote for you. Pope Gregory the Great. He was... Uh, uh, a, a Roman father from the year 604 AD, but I want to share this. It was beautiful. He is above all the mother of Christ who preaches the truth. For he gives birth to our Lord who brings him into the hearts of hearers. When you speak the word of God to others, what Pope Gregory here is saying, and you're preaching the truth, you bring Christ himself into the heart of hearers. And he is the mother of Christ who through his words inspires a love of our Lord in the spirit of our neighbor. You are the mother of Christ if you inspire the love of our Lord in the spirit 
of your neighbor. What a beautiful gift to be given to. What a beautiful name to receive. When we turn our hearts to Christ, we're called Mary. When we preach and share the word, we're told that we become and we're called, we receive this beautiful name, Mother of Christ, Mother of our Lord. When we turn our hearts in purity to God to see Him, we become and receive this, this, this voice calling to us, the Mother of our Lord. Why? Because Christ in us and us in Christ. Okay. Our identity, our union with God, should always bring forth life. You had a virgin who brought forth life. A virgin. We've heard it so many times it's ordinary. But a virgin brought forth life. And I tell you the truth, God can take your life that feels and looks like there's nothing going on there. There ain't no child coming out of that. <clears throat> there's no fruit coming. But I'm telling you, you and Christ, Christ in you, leads to miracles. Okay? Leads to something extraordinary happening. I want to, just before we jump into discussion, I want to share with you just a, a short video. It's about a minute and a half, so enjoy.